Okay, we're, we're up to 22 people, so I think officially we can get going. So it is my pleasure to introduce Alex Ruichauma. I hope I pronounced that correctly. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, he, he has had a varied physics career. He first worked on quantum simulation in cold atoms in optical lattices, and then he moved to work on superconducting circuits in David Schuster's group. And he has been a junior faculty assistant professor in Purdue since 2019. And he's going to talk to us about many body physics in driven dissipative superconducting circuits. So the floor is yours, Alex. And I asked Alex before, he said it's fine to interrupt with questions and comments. So please feel free to do so. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Can you hear me well? Yes. OK, great. Um, yeah, it's great to be here and to have this chance to tell you a little bit about um, what we're working on. Uh, so I started at Purdue in 2019. Um, it's been a somewhat slow three years. We're slowly working towards building things up here. Uh, so some of the experiments I will uh, show you are still work. Um, that was done when I was a postdoc in Dave Schuster and John Simon's groups at uh, U Chicago. Um, but I hope at least towards the end of the talk, I'll get to some of the new things that we are uh, working on right now, or at least hoping to work on. So um, we work with superconducting circuits, which I think many in the audience are probably quite familiar with. But rather than um, focusing on computation, we're more focusing on analog quantum simulation. And I want to show you today, uh, instead of the coherent parts of the system, uh, what if we use the tools of driven dissipation, the tools of engineered path, uh, in order to uh, look at interesting and uh, quantum, uh, quantum phenomena. So let me start with the motivation uh, of from, the, from coming from studying correlated materials. Of course, one big goal in physics is try to explore and understand various types of quantum phases and quantum phase transitions, for example. So here on the right, I have a very generic uh, phase diagram where you can see the two axes are temperature and some other physical parameter. And you have a quantum phase transition between some disordered states and the ordered states. You could also have some high temperature thermal states, for example. And if you think about a real piece of material and think about what we would have to do in order to understand these quantum phases and this phase transition, then you realize what we typically do is just to take a piece of material that has the Hamiltonian or the model that we want to study, and then we couple it to some kind of bath. The temperature is just a cold reservoir and this horizontal axis, which could be, for example, chemical potential, and that simply would be attaching your sample to some electrodes. So in this condensed matter setting, the path towards these interesting quantum phases is kind of natural, coupling to these paths. But in many cases, the dynamics of, or the microscopics of exactly how those interesting quantum phases are reached in the end is very hard to access. So what we are interested in is if we take the tools that we have in quantum simulators, so these are lab engineered quantum systems, either out of cold atoms or ions, or in this case, uh, superconducting qubits, can we bring in the tools or techniques of bath and reservoir engineering in order to help us understand the micro microscopics of these quantum dynamics and how the system, for example, uh, thermalize with baths in order to reach interesting quantum states. So this is the kind of material science or many body physics side of the motivation. But of course, once you have these tools and once you're able to manipulate and create these correlated phases, then you can also use the resulting entanglements for quantum information science applications. 
for example, as a resource for quantum computation or as a resource for quantum sense. Now, with this motivation, um, let me quickly still introduce superconducting circuits, even though I think many here are probably quite familiar with it. Uh, but let me do it more in the context of analog quantum simulation. What are some of the advantages and what are some of the challenges that comes with this platform? If we think about using superconducting circuits to engineer toy models for quantum simulation, which many people nowadays call synthetic quantum matter, one aspect of it is, of course, the ability to engineer different quantum Hamiltonians. For superconducting circuits, you have microwave photons that can live in high quality cavities and circuits for quite long. And using the tools of circuit QED, they can have also very strong interactions or couplings at the single photon level. So for example, one example here is a paper where they can achieve the so-called ultra strong coupling regime uh, between uh, qubits and a resonator. At least in 2D geometry, uh, because of this printed circuit approach of engineering these circuits, uh, there is a lot of flexibility in engineering different geometries and different connectivities. So for example, here on the left is um, a lattice from the Princeton group where they can tile these CPW resonators in order to simulate a lattice on a hyperbolic surface. Space with non trivial um, curvature. So these are the aspects that we have for engineering the system. Superconducting circuits, we work with microwave photons. That also means there is a whole suite of measurement tools that we can use. You can do spectroscopy, of course, in circuit QED, you can do very precise single qubit measurements, you can do at least partial tomography, and also. In many cases, you can look at the microscopics of these measurements uh, as well. So these are all the advantages. But then one thing that's kind of special with a photonic system like superconducting circuits is that it's intrinsically driven dissipative. The photons will eventually lose to the environment, and you have to populate the system with external drive. But on the other hand, in superconducting circuits, we also have a very precise control of coupling to the environment, including the measurements. So this is both a challenge and an advantage or, or an opportunity for us to think about how we can use engineered bath or engineered driven dissipation in order to uh, control this quantum system. Here, at least on the bottom, are just two examples where you can engineer the environments that a superconducting qubit sees. OK, so here is a quick outline of what I hope to cover today um, in the context of quantum simulation and building toy models for interesting quantum materials. I'd like to show you two examples of how we can build lattice models for microwave photons. I'll start with a very quick one, a topological lattice, just to give you a flavor of what's possible. And then I'll focus mainly on a one-dimensional Bose Hubble lattice. I use the second example uh, to then go into uh, the second topic of how we can engineer a driven dissipative path in order to prepare a many-body phase, but not just to prepare, actually to also protect it from dissipation. With those, I'll then hopefully still have some time to talk about what's next, uh, including the things that we're working on right now in my new lab at Purdue. So this first very quick example, without going into a lot of details, is one where we try to engineer interesting lattices for microwave photons that have topological properties. Think of this illustration here, which is an integer quantum Hall system. So these are electrons moving in a 2D sample with a perpendicular B field applied. So you have these skipping orbits, which are topologically protected edge states. 
We want to look into some of these related physics, but now using microwave photons. Of course, microwave photons don't feel the real B field the same way as electrons do. So the question is, how can we build a lattice where our microwave photons behave like electrons in a B field? As it turns out, on a lattice, in order for you to have an effective magnetic field, all you need is a non-reciprocal phase when a particle moves around one placket of a lattice. This is analogous to the Aronoff bomb phase that you have in this uh, electron case when you have this orbit, uh, one cyclotron orbit. So how do we do it? Well, I'm not going to talk about the too much technical details, but the way we engineer that phase is by having some of these lattice sites having a special mode structure for the microwave photons, where the phase of this microwave photon wraps around by 2 pi. So with the proper tiling of these cavities, you can engineer this non-reciprocal phase. So in, fit, in reality, one unit cell of this lattice looks like this. These are really cavities or lattice sites uh, for microwave photons drilled out of a single piece of metal. And they are coupled with nearest neighbor coupling. And if we make a large one, again, without knowing all the details, all that I want to show you is this indeed realize a topological lattice where if we excite at the right energy at one edge of this lattice, let me play this movie of a real uh, data, you can see the excitation, which are now microwave photons, only moves on this edge of this lattice and only in one particular direction without backscattering. And this is analogous to this electron case where you have these chiral edge states. This is just one very quick example of what kind of lattices we can engineer in circuit QED. And with this particular example, our goal is to then add interactions uh, in order to, in the future, access, for example, fractional quantum Hall physics in, in such a platform. And if you're interested, you can uh, look up this follow-up experiment in Dave and John's lab uh, that came out uh, not too long ago. So I'd really like to then now uh, talk about the bose hubble lattice, uh, how we can build it in circuits. And I will use this as an example to show you uh, most of the other bath engineering. Um, uh, ideas. So, any questions at this point? No, everything has been clear. Okay, great. So, in the case of this topological lattice, at least this data I'm showing here, this is mostly just pure wave mechanics. It's a microwave uh, photon. Uh, traveling in this linear array of cavities. There is nothing particularly quantum about it. The microwave photons, they don't really interact with them. In this follow-up work, we actually added a superconducting qubit in order to mediate strong photon-photon interactions. But now, for illustration purposes, we're going to implement this different both have a, a different lattice for microwave photons, where strong interaction is very strong at the single photon level. Now, the bose hubble lattice is actually very simple to describe. It only has two terms in the Hamiltonian. In this case, I'm drawing in 1D. You can have particles moving from one lattice site to its neighbor with a tunneling rate J. And the second term in the Hamiltonian is that if you have two particles, in our case, microwave photons, that happen to be on the same lattice site, then they experience interaction energy of magnitude U. Of course, you can also have the individual lattice sites have different local offset energies. The bose hubble lattice have two distinct ground states, depending on the relative strength between U and J. If the tunneling is very large, all the particles prefer to delocalize, and you are in this superfluid state, which is like a metal. And then on the other hand, if this interaction which is quantum mechanical, is very strong and dominates over the tunneling, then the photons 
will not want to move around too much. They will have this very strongly suppressed number fluctuation, and you end up in this insulating state, referred to as the Mott insulator. We have microwave photons, which is why we have the Bose Harbor lattice and the Fermi Harbor lattice for electrons, for example, is one of the minimal models where people think uh, you have the main ingredients for high TC superconductivity. So these models, even though they are very simple to write down, they're highly relevant for a lot of the open questions in many body physics. It is very natural, as I will show you in a minute, how to implement a both harbor lattice in superconducting circuits using arrays of superconducting qubits. So I'm only listing a few examples here from Google, from MIT for a 3 by 3 2D lattice, and also more recently from Oscar Painter's lab at Caltech, where they have a Bose Hubble lattice uh, coupled to a, a engineer waveguide, which allows us to have even more uh, tunability and knobs. For the experiments I'm going to show you, we're going to limit ourselves to the small insulator case where the tunneling is always much smaller than the on-site interaction. Okay, so how do we build a lattice? Again, I apologize if you've seen this before or if this is obvious, but intuitively, superconducting qubits or superconducting circuits are just collections of LC resonators. You can start with a linear LC resonator but for example, a transmon qubit is nothing but a slightly nonlinear LC resonator. You replace the linear inductor with a nonlinear inductor, which is our Josephson junction. And if you look at the level diagram, then you have this aharmonicity in this transmon qubit, which effectively gives you the on site interaction because when you add the first photon, it takes a particular energy, let's say in this case, five gigahertz. But when you add the second one, you have to put in a different amount of energy. For transform qubits that we use, this interaction is effectively attractive. Uh, but for the experiments I will show you, because this U is much larger than J, uh, whether it's the sign of the interaction doesn't come into play. Of course, there are many other approaches, different types of qubits that you can use in order to have, for example, a positive, meaning repulsive interaction. You could also have uh, circuits or qubits where you can engineer uh, multi, uh, many body uh, interactions, for example, a three body interaction. So this qubit, we can then view essentially as a lattice site for microwave photons. Now, all we need is to be able to make multiple lattice sites and combine them into a lattice. In the simplest case, you can simply take two of these qubits and you can tunnel couple them, for example, with a capacitor. You can also do it with an inductor. And by changing this coupling strength, you can change the tunneling rate for a microwave photon to move from one lattice site to its neighbor uh, with different rates. So this here is the image of our uh, sample in this previous work. Uh, in the middle of it, you see this 1D array of transmount qubits. So this would be very similar to what you would have in a quantum processor made out of superconducting qubits. But we now view this as a one-dimensional Bose Hubble lattice where the microwave photons can move with nearest neighbor coupling and they can interact with on-site interaction, which is equal to the harmonicity. The rest are fairly standard. For circuit QED, we have individual flux bias lines in order to change the on-site energies. Uh, in this particular example, the tunneling J is fixed, so is the, um, so the harmonicity U. We have individual readout resonators to read out the qubit states, or rather the photon number on each data site at the end of the experiments. And then what I will come back to later is we have some additional resonators and control lines in order to engineer this dissipative path that we will use to control uh, this lattice. 
just some quick numbers. Uh, you can see tunneling is much larger, much smaller than uh, the interaction U, which is by design. But I should also point out that with typical coherences we can get in superconducting circuits, we have a very coherent lattice before we introduce additional driven dissipation. Uh, in our case, for example, if you compare the single particle loss, which is few kilohertz to this tunneling J, you can see an individual microwave photon can tunnel about a thousand times coherently in this lattice before it's lost. And they can collide with each other or interact with each other even uh, faster or for, uh, for more cycles before uh, decoherence kicks in. And of course, compared to some of the other experimental systems, superconducting circuits uh, runs rather fast because we work in the microwave uh, frequencies. Here I'll just show you quickly, um, in the context of doing such an analog quantum simulation experiment, the types of characterization tools we can use. Of course, they are very similar to the typical measurement tools that you have in circuit KD. Because we have single site resolution, you can look at dynamics uh, of a single microwave photon, for example, in this case, between two nearest neighbors. And from this flopping back and forth, you can measure this tunneling J. You can also do this in a four side lattice instead of just two. And here you can see as a function of time on the X axis, the quantum walk of a single photon in this lattice. And in general, quantum walks but a few body quantum walks are a very useful tool for characterizing or diagonalizing, sorry, uh, run for characterizing many body uh, systems. As I mentioned, these are microwave photons, so you can also do spectroscopy. In this case, you can see the eight distinct eigenmodes of this eight side lattice that we have, uh, where all the individual eigenmodes can be resolved. And these tools combined. Uh, will allow us to fully characterize the system that we have built. If there are no questions, now let me move into the more interesting part. So we have built a bose hubble lattice, which at this point is just the empty lattice. So this is an interesting Hamiltonian, but we haven't put any particles into it. We have not been able to, if without doing anything, we won't be able to have any interesting quantum phase in it. So now the question is, can we couple this empty lattice to an engineered bath? And the goal here is these two are done separately. So you have an interesting Hamiltonian that we can engineer, and we have a bath, which I'll come back, which I'll come to in a second, what exactly that is. And the goal is when you combine these two elements, just like when you cool down a piece of real material in a cryostat, the bath will now help to thermalize the quantum system into some interesting quantum phase. And then we can use the tools uh, that we have to look at that quantum phase, and that would be the result of quantum simulation. Now, in our particular case, we take this empty bose hubble lattice, where you can see in the solid lines, uh, I'm noting state with one photon and then the state with two photons, which is detuned by the interaction U. And then there is the tunneling between them. And now we're going to couple that to an engineered bath. And this bath will be such that it will always have exactly one photon inside this bath, where this photon has an energy that's close to the ground state the ground band energy of the bose hubble lattice, meaning the n equals to one, uh, n, from, n, n, n equals to zero to n equals to one transition of the lattice. Now, if we couple the two together, you will see that this photon that's already in this engineer bath will like to tunnel into the empty lattice. When it does that, the bath is now empty. But as I said, we're going to have this magic object, which will have always exactly one photon in it. So this bath will magically produce another photon. At the same time, the photon that's already in the lattice can keep moving forward. 
in at least in this cartoonish picture, leaving room behind for the second photon to also went in, go into the lattice. So this process will now continue until this ground band of the lattice is fully populated. At this point, you won't be able to add any additional photons into the lattice anymore. And that is because if you want to add a second photon to this already occupied site, you have to pay an energy that's very different, that's detuned by this interaction U. But our bath can only provide photons at particular energy, which is now detuned. At the same time, within this already filled lattice, you, this process where instead of one and one, you end up with two and zero is also highly forbidden because again, it costs additional energy of you to have this uh, so-called Dublin hole pair. So the result of this simple cartoonish picture is that we end up in this more insulating state where we have exactly one photon per site in the lattice. And this state is actually stabilized against intrinsic losses in the sense that if at any point one of these photons inside the lattice is lost due to single photon losses, the bath will refill the whole lattice again, just like we uh, went through just now. And this is what we want to um, check experimentally, or we want to realize experimentally. Let me also mention quickly, because this will be useful later, that if you look at the many body spectrum, of this lattice and think of that in the context of this narrow band bath, essentially what we're doing is we have this bath that can cover all the eigenmodes in the ground band of the lattice, which has a spread of on the order of a few times the J, the tunneling. These states are all the states where you have no more than one photon per site. And any state that has more than one photon per site are in this upper manifold, which is detuned from this lower manifold by at least interaction U, which is much larger. So you have this many body gap in the middle, so that as long as your bath only co covers the lower half, you are guaranteed to end up in this um, final state with exactly one photon per site. Okay. Now, I think I have time to very briefly tell you how we actually engineer this bath. Um, it's quite simple, at least in one of the implementations. Think about a two-level qubit, a two-level cavity. You have zero photon states, one photon states, you have some intrinsic loss gamma. If I continue driving just on the zero to one transition, I'll never be able to have exactly one photon in it. At, in the steady state because of this intrinsic loss. But what, can, what I can do instead is I can bring in this two photon level, which is the F state of our transmon. Now, if you drive a coherent tone continuously on this zero to two transition, which will put in two photons into the qubit. And if in addition, I couple this two to one transition to a very lossy channel, then what happens is one of these two photons will quickly be lost. So now you have exactly one photon in this qubit. And this is in a continuous ma manner, because if any point this one photon is lost via this much slower intrinsic decay, this drive will bring it up again and then back to this one photon state. So this is how this bath engineered is engineered in order to have exactly one photon in it. And of course, um, looking at this, this is nothing uh, but kind of an analog of optical pumping or a level inversion in the laser. Okay, so now we have the lattice, we have the bath, and we can check or we can try what happens when we couple the bath to this empty lattice. So in this case, we have the lattice on the left hand side, we have the bath coupled via the end on the right. I'm going to show you the population, uh, 
rather the probability of having exactly one photon on each lattice site as a function of time. So we're starting with blue, which means all the lattice sites are empty. And we're hoping to get to this more insulated state where P1 is close to one, meaning you have one photon per site. So as I show you this data, you can see indeed population of microwave photons start to enter this lattice from the right-hand side, and then eventually fill up the whole lattice until it's pretty close to exactly one photon per site. A few things that you will notice. One, you can see this ballistic propagation of population into the lattice and this ballistic uh, transport is a hallmark of the coherent tunneling inside the lattice. Or uh, for experts in the audience, this is the light cone propagation of correlations or density in this case. We have in this particular case about 90% fidelity, but that's primarily dominated by thermal population in this reservoir. And these errors are mostly just holes, meaning they are missing some particles. We know how to improve that, and in principle, we can get fidelities uh, close to 98 or 99% with our parameters. Now, so we can now prepare this many-body state, and I, just should, I should just mention or reiterate again, here the state will stay in this more insulator phase as long as the drive is turned on, as long as the bath is turned on, even though you have intrinsic Photon losses. Okay, so now we can prepare dissipatively this many body state but with the tools that I show you of single site control and single site readout, we can also look at dynamics on top of this many body state. What we can do, for example, is prepare the small insulator state and then create a hole inside it by taking out one photon in this case, on this leftmost lattice site. For the first data I'm going to show you, we're going to turn the bath off. So this is, again, now just the coherent both harbor lattice without additional driven dissipation. You can now see, as a function of time, this single hole on top of an interacting many-body state undergo a quantum walk inside this lattice, where it propagates ballistically back and forth. And at long terms, there is some defacing, uh, mostly due to some residual uh, disorder in the lattice. We then repeat the same experiments, but now we can turn this bath on, just like we did before, and look at how this defect propagates. You can see it still ballistically travels to the right, but as soon as it hits the right-hand side, where, it's where this bath is, it gets replenished or gets refilled by the bath like we went through in the animations. So this on the right-hand side is actually a microscopic view of how the bath can refill and protect this many-body state. So that's most of the data I want to show from these sets of experiments. Clearly, there are many open questions once you can do this. For example, you can think about what's the optimal uh, spatial distribution of these baths um, when you're trying to uh, prepare different many-body states, for example. What are the optimal spectral properties? Here, the final state that we get is the steady state of this driven dissipative system. So you can also ask, is it actually the same as the equilibrium mod insulator for the closed quantum system, or are there differences uh, that we can measure? And of course, going forward, which I will talk about more, is thinking about this driven dissipative preparation scheme. Can we use it to apply to other quantum phases, uh, perhaps that ones that have stronger quantum correlations? Let me point out one comparison uh, for experts in the audience, thinking about different preparation schemes in 
various quantum simulation platforms. Typically, most quantum simulators are kept coherent and closed. And we use adiabatic preparation to go from, let's say, an easy to prepare ground state to some more interesting many body phase. There, you have to follow this cool, the adiabatically evolved um, approach. It has been extremely successful, but it also has challenges in terms of heating, in terms of the many body gap closing as the system gets larger and larger, so on and so forth. What we are showing here is a different approach or complementary approach for many body preparation where the state is protected against intrinsic losses. I have only shown you the implementation where I have this bath that can add particles to a many body system. But in principle, you could also engineer a second piece where you have a entropy dump, another bath that can take out excitations and that can provide continuous cooling of the many body state. The other thing for comparison is that our scheme works directly in the target phase, meaning that you do not have to go through this quantum critical region where the gap might be uh, exponentially small. And of course, I should mention that uh, these driven dissipative schemes or these bath engineering now discussed in the context of analog quantum simulation, simulation is very intimately connected to ideas of quantum error correction uh, in the case of quantum computing and quantum information problems. I'm going to pause briefly here uh, in case there are any questions. And um, I do have plenty of time, so I'll talk about what's coming up next. What can we do uh, along these lines of research and what we're working on in the lab right now? Um, any and, questions, guys? And if not, so I'll, of course, just continue. OK. Um, so what I've shown you now or so far is a driven dissipative system uh, where we're using the tools of bath engineering or this driven dissipation to prepare and manipulate quantum states. So generally speaking, we want to apply it to two places, which is what I mentioned in the first slide. One is to explore different aspects of many body physics, looking at interesting condensed matter models, maybe also models in high energy physics to do quantum simulation experiments. And of course, at the same time, if you can prepare and manipulate entanglements of quantum correlations, then you can, of course, use the same states or the same system uh, to explore applications uh, for quantum information science. Let me start with what kind of states or phases can we apply this to and what we want to explore. Remember I mentioned pre previously that the way the MOS state, the MOS insulator state preparation works is because the state has a very large many body gap that is U, and which is the dominant energy scale in the system. And the path we engineered is relatively narrow band, such that we only put in photons in the lower bands, not excite anything in the upper bands. But what if we want to look at more interesting phases that have stronger correlations? things that have low lying excitations or things like topological phases where you don't necessarily have this very large many body gap. Can you still do this path engineering and prepare a many body quantum state, quantum phase with these classical paths? Of course, the analogy I made with real materials should tell you that we probably should in some way but it's a little bit more complicated. Um, as it turns out, you will have to now really use two pieces of the bath. You have to create a particle source like we did, and you have to have this entropy dump to take out any thermal excitations that you don't want. And if you look at this diagram, you realize now this is like a chemical potential for light. 
Of course, light doesn't naturally have a chemical potential. But if you can engineer this path, then you are essentially filling up your many body system up to some energy and then also being able to cool uh, anything that's above that. So there are proposals for doing exactly that. And if you can do that, then you'll be able to dissipatively stabilize strongly correlated phases, even if they have low lying energies and low, li low lying excitations. So for example, in this paper, they numerically checked that you could, um, with this engineered path, prepare strongly correlated or strongly interacting superfluids in, for example, the system that I showed you, uh, when we go to a case where the J and U are more comfortable. Other things that you can think about. So, so far, all the things that I mentioned were basically trying to create, prepare some ground state like phases, something that have a equilibrium counterpart or analog. But the system, our system, is intrinsically driven dissipative. So, you can also ask what kind of non equilibrium phases can you get? What kind of driven dissipative phases that you can get that may not have an equivalent in the equilibrium case or in the closed quantum system case. You can also think of doing transport type measurements, just like in real condensed matter materials, and look at thermalization or quantum thermodynamics, for example. You can move the two parts of the bath to different parts or two sides of the lattice, and now you have two pieces with slightly different chemical potentials, and you will be able to uh, probe at a microscopic level the propagation of particles, of quantum correlations, and for example, of entanglement. Things that are relevant for both many body physics and quantum information that you can't readily access in uh, either real materials or, in fact, in some of the quantum simulation platforms. Uh, okay, so. Since I do have time, let me quickly tell you one idea that we're pursuing for generating a bath like this. Um, and I'll talk about how we can apply it in different scenarios. Uh, the idea is very simple uh, and probably used in many of uh, people in the audience in, in various uh, scenarios. So imagine if you have a qubit and the resonator, which we will later use as a bath, that are coupled with some coupling G, and the two are frequency detuned. And we're going to enable a resonant coupling between the two simply by via a parametric coupling or parametric drive. If you modulate either the qubit frequency or the tunnel or this coupling rate G at a frequency that's equal to the energy difference between them then you're providing the energy in order for the microwave photon to tunnel coherently and resonantly between the two. On the other hand, if you modulate at the sum of the two energies, or sometimes experimentally we do it at half of that, but that's mostly just a technical detail, then what you do is you're driving a process where you're putting in one photon into the qubit and one photon into the resonator at the same time. So it's like a two photon drive. These are nothing but what we refer to as the red and the blue sidebands because of their frequencies or the colors. Many of you have probably have seen this. This is one such uh, experiment where you can see the chevron pattern showing the coherent swap of a single, in this case, a single photon between the qubit and the resonator when we drive around this red sideband. And this is data from one of our test devices. And the key here is that the effective coupling rates and the effective detuning are both dynamically tunable simply by changing the driving amplitudes and the driving frequency. So how does this help our bath engineering? Well, now imagine we add a very large loss to this resonator, kappa you see that the red sidebands now become a pure photon loss because any microwave photon that tunnels from the qubit into the resonator will just be lost. 
On the other hand, the blue side band, where you put one photon into the qubits and one photon into the lossy resonator, now correspond to a gain for the qubits because the photon in the resonator is lost and you are left with one additional excitation in the qubits or in the many body system. So this is precisely how, or at least one way, we can engineer these two pieces of this engineer path that we require. Having both an entropy dump in the form of a loss or drain and a particle source in the form of gain or a source. And again, the key here is that the spectra of these two pieces can be dynamically tunable simply by changing the parameters of the parametric drive. So that would allow us, for example, to couple or to implement you know, most of these ideas that I'm showing here. Uh, but up to this point, all the ex ideas I'm showing here are all paths coupled locally to a uh, lattice. But of course, you can couple locally, but at various places, and you can have interesting dynamics in that way, but they're all local. So another interesting aspect that we're interested in exploring is what happens if we can have non-local paths, and what kind of interesting quantum entanglements can we generate? As it turns out, for example, in this proposal, if you still have just the 1D lattice with nearest neighbor coupling, and you have the engineered path that's coupled simultaneously to two middle qubits, you can dissipatively prepare a volume law long range entangled uh, bell like state. So, the way this works, let me show it here, is you want to have two qubits, so start with just the middle two, and then you have a loss resonator. And then, if you can engineer the blue as right, red, red side bands, like I showed before, one on each arm, now you have a dissipative process where one qubit will lose one excitation and that excitation will go to the other qubits. But this is dissipative and the reverse process does not occur. As it turns out, even in this two qubit case, the steady state of the system is a bell-like state, it's an EPL state, sorry, EPR state. And interestingly, if you just keep this dissipative, this quasi-local path, and now couple it instead of just two qubits, but to this whole lattice, in the steady state, you can create this so-called rainbow state where the qubits are pairwise entangled in a bell state. And this rainbow state have a number of applications um, for quantum information science uh, applications. And remember here, we're creating this long-range entangled states with only quasi-local path and only nearest neighbor interactions within the lattice. This is one experiment that we're actually implementing right now. In the middle, you can see a piece of this device that we are testing right now. We've already shown uh, all of the bu building, uh, all of the uh, building uh, blocks that we need to do the stabilization. I unfortunately don't have uh, final data to show you, uh, too much to show you today, but I hope we will be able to um, try this stabilization, uh, this entanglement generation out uh, in the near future. I should also mention that there are many other possibilities of coupling the path in various different ways. I mentioned already this simple case of end coupling the path to a lattice. I mentioned briefly how we can go from local path to quasi-local path. But of course, you can then also have more qubits coupled directly to the single common path uh, to have a, this non-local uh, long-range couplings. And this is very natural for engineering coherent interactions, but now you have the dis interplay between coherent and dissipative dynamics. And if you stretch this out a bit more, then you you see that this is also closely related to waveguide QED experiments or quantum optics type experiments where the path simply becomes a 
continuous waveguides or engineered waveguide. And this is an idea that many groups are pursuing in terms of bath or uh, bath engineering. Finally, I just want to mention that I do have a separate direction uh, in the lab where instead of doing quantum simulation with superconducting qubits, we're using superconducting circuits or qubits to probe real quantum materials. And this is in collaboration with uh, some of the condensed matter groups here at Purdue. I'm pretty much at the end of the talk. I just want to show you a few more images of where we are in the lab. Uh, I started in 2019. We moved into the new lab about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half ago. And we, I think we've been making uh, steady progress. And with that, I would like to just thank the group that did, uh, that's working hard to get the experiments running. Uh, of course, also uh, Dave, and Sh Dave Schuster and John Simon's group at Chicago, for where I was the postdoc. And uh, thank you for um, being here. Thank you, Alex, for a very good talk. Uh, are there any comments and questions? Yeah, a good question. Um, yeah. uh, first of all, thanks, Alex. It was a great talk. Um, really enjoyed it. And I'm excited to hear about all this new stuff that's going on there. Um, so my question was related to these non-local baths. And if there's, there's something there um, that can provide insight into um, sort of real world materials, um, sort of like like how real world, you know, modern slaters exist. And then we can look at these dynamics uh, in simulation here. Is yeah, there something yeah. uh, with these non-local interactions um, that's analogous uh, in real materials? And is it related to sort of this like tunable Markovianity in your system where you can change like how much reciprocal nature, like the reciprocal nature of your bath? Yeah, okay, great, great. Thanks uh, for this question. So I think maybe there are a few at least two different pieces. Uh, one is thinking about this non-local bath, uh, where in, for example, real materials might this come in to play or might be interesting. So I can provide maybe one example or one thing that people are thinking about. Um, there are proposals already previously for dissipative stabilization of a fractional quantum Hall state. Um, in quantum simulation platforms. But then the question arises, you have these uh, excitations on top of these fractional quantum Hall states, which can, uh, which can you know, dissociate and can fractionalize. So then the question is, are local baths actually uh, efficient for stabilizing or protecting these phases? Uh, and, and so in some cases, it turns out that you might actually prefer to have non-local bath for that purpose. So it might you know, also be relevant for, for real materials uh, when you are thinking of how to efficiently prepare these states in a 2D sample. Um, the other piece is if you now have these non-local baths, uh, how can you tune, let's say, between Markovian, you know, purely classical bath and something that has memory? I think the question is certainly yes. Uh, you know, if you can have a bath, uh, you know, instead of coupling our lattice system directly to a dissipative bath, you could couple it to some metal material with multiple modes or some uh, waveguides before coupling them to a real loss. So then that way you can have a tunability between a purely dissipative or purely Markovian and something that has coherent dynamics. In it. All right, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, sorry, Alex, I, my internet dropped out uh, when you said hi to me, um, but hi. Uh, and yeah. um, my question is that, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're, what kind of materials you're probing um, in the other effort that you mentioned yeah. again? Um, so I can give maybe um, two different, you know, very briefly, just kind of hand-wavingly, two examples. Uh, so one thing, well, so here, there are, we're, we're pursuing two approaches. One is 
uh, to actually embed quantum materials uh, into the circuits to make kind of a hybrid device, right? Uh, and uh, this can either bring new functionalities to the qubits or circuits themselves, or now you are essentially, by probing these hybrid structures, uh, using the tools of circuit QED to probe those materials. So in that uh, direction, uh, one of our colleagues here, they make uh, Joseph, they have they make Joseph's injunctions out of topological insulators. So these are uh, superconductor TI superconductor Joseph injunctions, and they have some of the uh, cleanest uh, 3D TI materials where the transport is only via the top surface states. So we are essentially making a transmon-like device with this STIS junction, and. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be the highest coherence transmon <laughs> out there, but uh, as a way to probe the material. Um, this is one approach, and the other is uh, basically just to use existing uh, qubits as directly as sensors to directly probe quantum materials. So, for example, uh, for 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 sensing, let's say, charge noise in various quantum materials. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Alex. Thank you for a very good talk. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks.